1914, with increasing numbers of young men joining the armed forces to fight the war, women were expected to fill the jobs left by the men. With low wages being paid to farmhands, the agricultural community saw a particular rush of men leaving the fields for the army, or to fill the jobs left in other occupations. The government decided that more women would have to become involved in producing food and goods to support the war effort, but some farmers resisted this measure, so in 1916 the Board of Trade began sending agricultural organising officers around the country in an effort to persuade farmers to accept women workers. In 1917, Roland Prothero, the Minister for Agriculture, formed the Women's Land Army and by the end of the year there were over 260,000 women working on the land. In 1939 Britain was at war again and many young women signed up for the war work as their mothers had done 25 years earlier. With Allied shipping being sunk at the hands of the German U-boats and with young farmhands again going off to war, Lady Trudy Denham revived the Women's Land Army. Girls from all walks of life and with varying backgrounds signed up for the healthy lifestyle that the Women's Land Army promised. This is the story of some of those blessed girls told in their own words. Well, my friend, who was 18 at the time, had to do either munitions or a land army or the wax or whatever. So she said to me, um, come with me. I said, I'm not old enough. So she said, oh, come and we'll go up Oxford Street and uh, see the people. And she, they just interviewed me and they said, yeah, OK. I told them I was uh, 17. So, uh, yeah, I put my age up. And I didn't question it, I just went. And I was in there for two and a half years till the war ended. I worked on a farm from the age of 15, so it was quite natural for me to join the Land Army when I was eight, which was the age that you could join. And um, so, um, but I had quite an experience before I joined the Land Army. And uh, I worked on a small holding. Well, we were doing war work, uh, my friend and I, in, um, oh, I forget where it was now. Anyway, we were doing war work, and then we decided, oh, we fancied going into the land army. So we went down to the job centre place. I think that was where you had to go. They said, sorry, no, you're doing war work. And we were quite upset, and we went there time and time again, and I think they got so fed up with us that in the end they said, all right, you can go. <laughs> so off we went to Romford. We had to go to see a farmer's wife, I believe it was, and I was very, very skinny. That was 1944, and uh, I didn't fancy going in the services. My father was a regular in the Air Force, and we travelled all over the place. I just came home from Egypt when I was born, so I was nearly an Egyptian, I think. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, I worked in an office and I wanted to do something and I just thought, well, I like the country. I've always liked the country. I'd like to join the Land Army. Well, I joined the Land Army because my mum had died and my dad was eventually, I mean, not straight away, was going out with another woman and... I lived just with my dad because the boys were in the army and my sister was working away on munitions and I was sort of left alone, you know. And then I went up to wherever you went, where they joined up and said, I want to join up, think of somewhere to go. And they said, oh, you can join the land army if you like because of your age. So I said, fine, I'll go in the land army. And a week later, they, well, yeah, they sent me to this farm. <laughs> There was a man, his wife, and one little girl, daughter. Well, I did milk all 40 cows in the morning. I had to go and get them, milk them all, take them back again to field, go back and clean all the cow shed up. And then when I went indoors, I had to do all the little girls' washing. And I said to her, this doesn't come in my job. You know, I don't have to do that sort of thing. Well, I stayed there for a week. And she said, you can have the half day. So I said, I'm not having the half day, I'm going. I'm very strong-minded, you know. <laughs> so I went into town again and went to the Land Army office and told them. And they put me up somewhere just for one night. 
And then they sent me to the other farm and they said, there's another girl there, you like that? I was billeted in Clacton and uh, one of the first farms we went on was at Wivenhoe. I don't know whether you know Wivenhoe. Yeah, then from Wivenhoe we sort of worked on the land. I didn't, ma I didn't work very long on farms. I worked on two farms actually. One was a sunflower farm and the other one was sort of um, a general farm, you know what I mean? Other than that, we worked in the fields. You know, we used to dig out trenches, you know, the big tank traps and all that sort of thing. We used to dig all them out. We didn't dig them out, we cleaned them out to make sure they were clean, you know, and all that. And um, I drove the tractors. We went on the thrashing machines. And um, I even ploughed the ground with the horses and a plough, you know, and um, all kinds of things like that. A newly signed up land girl received her uniform and a rail warrant to her billet. A few were sent to agricultural colleges, such as Whittle. However, many were sent straight to farms to begin work. Accommodation was varied. Some girls were billeted in private houses or commandeered buildings such as hotels. Many girls were billeted in newly erected temporary hostels. Each hostel had a hostel mother who ensured the girls behaved themselves. The hostel was very, it was um, one of these big houses and um, all, our host, um, all our beds were um, bunks. We all had bunk beds, you know, and there was always quite a few bunk beds in one room, you know. So, but everything was, we were always comfortable. We was never uh, deprived or anything, really, you know. And of course, when your sandwiches, you just made your sandwiches and whatever it was, you were grateful because um, <laughs> you couldn't get things so easy then days. I was based at Stansted Station Road in a hostel. There were 40 girls altogether. Well, the hostel was on uh, Red Butler's estate and uh, it had the huge big house in the grounds. And there were uh, English soldiers that were wounded, were put in the big house in the same grounds. Well, the hostel was a ministry building with the three of the big pot-bellied stoves down the middle to keep us warm. And it had an ablution block. It was a sort of a T-shaped building with the dormitory on one part of the T, the ablution block on the other part, and the straight part was our dining hall and the kitchens. And uh, we each, we had a bunk, four bunks in a what we called a bay. So there was a, two bunks, little dressing tables back to back, and small wardrobes and uh, I had a top bunk and they were all quite comfortable and warm. A land girl's work was varied dependent on the type of farm on which they were stationed or the season of the year. The work was hard and at times could be dangerous too. We were sent out to different places uh, but my boss was always willing to get me back again quick, you know, because, um, well, you've got to be interested in your work. And so many of these boys were going to war uh, that they were, we were getting short of uh, labour. And um, so we had to well, do other jobs that we'd never done before. When a farmer needed a gang of girls, they used to send down to the hostel and pick out the girls they wanted. And there were usually about 12 of us in a gang. And we were either taken in a little bus to the farms or we had to cycle. And they provided the cycles for us. A typical day uh, was uh, milking would come first, uh, then stripping the cows Putting the putting the cows onto the milking machines, stripping them out, and we all did that, the two boys as well. And then they would go into the fields, I would wash everything down, 
clean out the cow sheds, clean the yard, and uh, get on to whatever needed doing. Uh, the first job we had to do was uh, cutting down, uh, I forget what it was called, Lucerne I think it was, we had to cut down, that was the first job we ever did, but we had to dig ditches and hedging, we, we learned how to do hedging and layer the branches in to form another hedge. And uh, we did, well, just about everything that, pulling up mangoes, sugar beet, kale, and uh, then if any of the farmers needed just a couple of girls to do something, uh, my friend and I were chosen to look after a pig farm. And uh, we used to get up early each morning and go down and uh, the Americans used to bring lorry loads of all the food that they'd wasted for the pigs. And we used to have to cook it in great big uh, ovens and feed the pigs. And when we got back at night, the girls wouldn't let us in the hostel because we smelt of pigs. So we had to... Uh, go into the ablution block and get washed and changed before they'd let us go into the dining room. And uh, two of our friends were taught to do thatching. Well, I expect we got up about seven o'clock and uh, we probably started work about eight o'clock till six. And because in the, in the winter you had that extra, extra hour, you know, that double summer time, they say, or double winter time, whatever. So we could work longer. But, um, yeah, but we never worked in the rain. <laughs> when it rained, we thought, oh, day off. But, no, that was that was it. But we just got on with it. Just never thought nothing of it, really. We sometimes have to go out there and uh, pick greens, you know, like the sprouts and all that sort of thing, where our hands used to be freezing cold. Or another time we might be doing rhubarb uh, setting and that. And up that end and up that end, so we couldn't see each other till we met because of the fog. You know, just general things like that. At one point, I know I was asked to clear Mr and Mrs Thorne's. They had a very, very small orchard, very small. Um, and it was covered in couch grass. And I worked myself to death digging that over getting it all clear of couch grass and I did it mind you it probably all came back again I'm sure I didn't I didn't uh, get every every little root out but I did work hard at that but that wasn't typical that was unusual but little jobs like that he would ask me to do I worked on a chicken farm he picked me out to work on a chicken farm that was horrible horrible that was not that at all because they were batteries I think they were the beginning of the batteries at the time, battery hens, and um, it was a horrible job. And you get all these poor little hens, all in little s square cages, in tiers and rows, ever so long. And the eggs used to roll down to the end of their cage, and we had to <laughs> we had to record every egg that was laid. And what happened to me one day? I picked all these eggs up on the egg trays, and Dolly tripped. <laughs> Imagine all those eggs, can't you? So I had to fiddle the figures to make it work out that I hadn't fallen over and broken all these eggs. Or so I'd have been for the chop, I should think. Another silly job I, I would do, the pigs would all go out, go out in the field and of course they root the grasses or they turn tufts of grass over, you know, and it's all, uh, all um, turned up. And I would have to go out there with a fork and, or whatever was handy and turn all the little turves back <laughs> and make it all right again ready for them ready for them to go and do it again <laughs> when we did the uh, harvesting that was really hard work because you had to pitch the well you had to stook the sheaves up which they don't do anymore like they look like little indian wigwams and uh, when they were dried out enough, we had to load them onto the wagons. And uh, you had to load them with the heads of the sheaves in and the stalks out. And uh, then when that was taken, you had to stack them, build the haystacks. 
And that was from early in the morning till late at night we did that. Well, our first job was mac spreading, if you know what that is. That was our first job. We thought, oh, <laughs> you know, but, yeah. And then we did thrashing. Uh, we had to have a group of people with... Um, uh, we had a man up there and uh, what some of them do chaffing and cutting the, the bonds and that. So we did thrashing. We did hoeing, which is photos there of hoeing, and um, haystacks, all sorts, milking. We wasn't mainly milking. We wasn't really on a dairy farm, but we did a little bit. Of, but mainly it was... Uh, field work and uh, general, you know, and um, that was it. Two of our friends were taught to do thatching, which was really good because they did a barn for Holst, the uh, the musician, and uh, they even they were entertained by his wife too. And I can remember them saying that she had white carpets. And she wouldn't let them take their boots off. She just said, come in, you know, don't worry about the carpets. But there were so many different things, you know, the adventures that different girls had and different jobs that they did. And there was a field of kale just down from the hostel and it grew to about six foot high. And when it rained, we were just saturated because it was above our heads and we had to walk in between it and chop it down. So that wasn't very pleasant. And the one job I really hated, and that was picking Brussels sprouts, because it was always snowing and icy when we were picking them and our fingers used to, you know, almost bleed. Haymaking, we used to um, have to do these um, stacks and that. And one of the, one of the um, farmers used to insist that I used to go up when he was thatching the top. And he would never used to let me get off that until <laughs> The last bit was put down, then I had to slide down. And it was most scary doing it. Mm -hmm. Another time, we, two of us girls had to um, guard two of the stacks because there's an arsonist had got loose from one of the places where they had kept them. And what we would have done if it had turned out, I, we don't know. <laughs> the other job that we really loved was fruit picking at Elsenham. Captain Carr had an estate there, and I think there was a jam factory there too. But we started off on uh, black currants, raspberries, and strawberries, and then we moved into the orchards for apples, pears, and plums, and that was a lovely job because we managed to get something to eat, which was better than four slices of bread. <laughs> oh, yes, my, we were ditching, and uh, my friend Millie, she was a clown and she fancied the farmer, and she pretended to faint. She uh, actually went right back into the water and she was soaked. So our ganger had to uh, form a barricade round the bonfire, and she had to take her clothes off and they had to be dried before she could start work again. The same girl, another time we were hedging, and she chopped right through her Wellington boot with the chopper into her foot and all the other girls ran away <laughs> because they didn't like the sight of blood. And I managed to ease it off and she'd cut the side of her foot with the chopper. And uh, the farmer had to take her to either the doctors or I think it, he took her to the doctors. We were mucking out one day and at that time we were going to have a dance for the prisoners of war. Because there was a dance every three times a week. I mean, it doesn't matter how hard you worked. You went home, got dressed, and went to a dance in the evening. And this time we said, we'll, we'll have a dance for the prisoners of war. We collected all the raffle prizes and everything. And uh, the night before we were mucking out, and my friend put the four-time fork right through her foot. And I knew she didn't like blood, so I said, Rose, don't look down had to take her home and the doctor wasn't going to let her come to the dance, but she did, she just sat there. We made quite a lot of money. Oh, one dreadful day, though, it was a very, very high wind and I had to go into this little hen house, bent, double, you might say, like this, 
go around it and pick up the hedge. And what happened, a very high wind came up, slammed the door, and I was locked in this little barn with no way of getting out. And all the hens were coming in at the, you know, the, that bit where they actually come in. And I thought, I'm going to get pecked to death. I was so terrified, I really was terrified then. So I laid on the floor and got managed to get my head out the bit that they were coming in and screamed and shouted for the other people who were all doing jobs. I could see them, but they didn't know what had happened to me. And then it was time to go home and they all went to get their bicycles and they said, where's Anne? Because they used to call me Anne then. I don't know, she went down to collect the eggs and they found me lying on the floor of the chicken coop, covered in hens, mm. and being feared that I would end my days pecked to death in a hen house. Haymaking one time, I was um, with a two-time fork. It had gone right through my um, wellington, but lucky enough it had gone in between my toes and not through my toe. <laughs> the other was falling through, in the first farm this was, was falling through the hay cart. Now, you got the hay on the fork and you put it, and somebody stood on the top to get a pitchfork again to build it up, you know. And I had stepped too far that way and gone down between the hay and the cart wheel and the wheel. See, I nearly died here, I think, a couple of times. What would be pecked to death with hens. And then they were just about to start the go on along to the next bit and somebody said where's Anne where's Anne gone and there I was jammed between the oh it was horrible talk about claustrophobia with all this straw sticking up my nose and in my eyes and in my ears and so anyway that was the, the other nasty thing that happened to me then there was me with mum in plaster for six weeks because I was on the top of the thrashing machine and I don't know if you know anything about the thrashing machine, but I had the fork and it caught and it sent my thumb back. And that's when I had my arm in plaster for six weeks. So I was home all that time. The long hours didn't leave much time for going out or dating, but the girls always seemed to manage a few hours of fun. For the first time in their lives, many girls had independence. Most of them had never been away from home before. While some of the girls were homesick, the majority relished this newfound freedom. It was a time when many girls met their husbands. Uh, when I first was going out with my, my husband, he was the farmer's son. And you know how a chap comes up behind you and goes like that? Well, he did this to me. Didn't know. I mean, it wasn't my fault. He just did this. And uh, his dad called me over afterwards and he said, if I ever see you talking to Jim again, I'll sack you on the spot. Didn't want him to marry a land girl. <laughs> didn't want him going out with a land girl. But um, it didn't happen. It went on and on. You know, we, we in the end, we married in 1948. You know, I didn't realise then I was going to marry him because he was so good looking. I thought, cool, he's nice. But then I didn't like him after a time because <coughs> he had a younger brother. And I think girls are more mature than boys, aren't they? And he used to act the fool with his brother. And I, thought, I didn't like him. But he kept on and on. He used to meet me at the station and he'd, he'd come up and see me when I was home. And uh, he ran after me, actually. <laughs> so I gave in in the end. <laughs> well, his brother got killed on a motorbike. And, uh, well, he wrote and said, oh, you're the only one I've got in all this business, you know. And I went back with him and uh, later married him. Many girls, having led sheltered lives before the war, found their land army years to be a defining period. They would mostly agree that these were the best years of their lives. We used to go into Grimsby to a place called the Gaiety Ballroom. We used to enjoy that because all the bands used to come up from London. Live bands, obviously. Joe Loss, Geraldo, all those sort of people just come up. And um, we used to enjoy those dances. 
I remember one night, it was a terrible winter, really pretty. It was freezing everywhere. And we went out this evening to where the soldiers were, I forget what it was called, like a canteen place. And on the way back, because there was no cars in those days, we held hands all across the road, one soldier, one girl, and ran and slid. All down. Can you imagine doing that now with all the cars? So we used to have some great times, you know. The lady that looked after the hostel, Mrs Dover, she was a right dragon. And I can remember uh, one evening, these Americans came to the front doors and they were the doors were all locked and they were banging on the door and they were saying, uh, come on, I forget what they called her, but they said, uh, <coughs> we're the bees and you've got the honey pot. And Mrs Dover chased them down the path and up the road with a broom. <laughs> and another time there were some of them, they were banging on the window of the dormitory and they really frightened the girl in the next bay to ours and they were asking for somebody named Eleanor and we hadn't got anybody named Eleanor in the hostel. And I opened the window and told them to go away. And... Uh, I, they gave me, you know, some cheek. I said, if you were, uh, if I was a man, I'd punch you right in the face. So one of them came right up to the window and said, go on then, and I did. And he called me a <laughs> <laughs> And they were uh, reported to the uh, officers up at the airport, and I think they, you know, got told off for it. I don't think there was. We laughed so much. We had so much, such a good time. And our our man that we was billeted with and his wife, he was so funny. He used to make us laugh so much. And I think we were always laughing. We had, you know, we were so happy. But we always seemed to be laughing. A thrashing tackle. And it was owned by this family. They had the steamroller and the water carrier and the whole lot, and the farmer hired it from these people. And it was winter time, <coughs> and I'll ne never forget the uh, the first morning we went there, they couldn't get the, st the uh, steam engine to start up, which drove the thrashing tackle. And the farmer uh, came out to see what was going on. And what they'd done, they'd left the pipe that led from the water thing to the engine. They'd left it laying on the ground and the water inside it had frozen. So one of the sons of the family, they were real old country boys, he set light to the what we called the chaff and cavings that, that was left over, set light and ran the pipe through it and burnt a hole in the pipe. So that was the first day. And everything went wrong. All the time we were working on that tackle, everything went wrong. And my mate said to me, well, the only thing that can happen now is the engine will blow up. And it did, because I hadn't put enough water in the boiler or something. And, uh, well, the poor farmer, he was at his wit's end. And the funny part was, we used to go in the barn in the morning to wait for this family to start the, the tackle up. And there was a brazier in the farm and all the coal that they used on this steamroller. So we used to make a beautiful fire in this brazier to keep us all warm. And the farmer came out one day and he said, oh, you girls have got a lovely fire here. It's warmer here than it is in my kitchen. He didn't realise we were using all the coal he was paying for. <laughs> With a growing interest in all things World War II, the memory of the land girls is kept alive by collectors and reenactors. I've, um, I've had an interest in the Women's Land Army for a long time, I, I suppose because of my family connections with the land and farming and owning the Shire horses and collecting vintage vehicles and implements. And of course, being a woman, um, the Women's Land Army seemed the natural thing to get involved in. Reenacting is great at preserving uh, and showing people our history. Reenactors collect uniform, memorabilia and images and many of these things would have been lost forever. But now they're preserved and respected for others to appreciate in years to come. There's a tremendous fascination with the Land Army, which seems to be growing year by year. Fashion chains have now launched ranges of Land Army themes of clothing. The London College of Fashion has featured the Women's Land Army uniform in their latest research publication. 
whilst reenacting is tremendous fun and living history, we do not even begin to realise the hardships that the Land Armies endured day in, day out. I really respect the Land Army ladies who did so much to keep former generations fed during the war, allowing the men to go out and fight for our country and maintain the freedom we enjoy and take for granted today. At the end of the war, in 1945, the services of many of the land girls were no longer required. However, as there was still a shortage of food, some stayed on until the Women's Land Army was finally disbanded in November 1950. Soon after, all records of the Women's Land Army were destroyed. Over 55 years after the last land girl went home, the government has finally decided to honour those land girls still alive with a medal. I'm really delighted that they're now being recognised by the government. They're finally allowed to take part in the Remembrance Sunday service at the Cenotaph. And surviving ladies will receive a DEFRA medal in recognition of their war effort. Land girls are portrayed in a very romantic light in the films, but in reality they had an incredibly hard life. Out in all weathers, working on the land, heavy dirty work, with animals often in very harsh conditions. I think we should all salute them.